When I saw my emaciated boy with bruises, welts, burns, and dark circles under his eyes from my wife, I realized I had to get him out of the situation at any cost. To hell with my marriage or the life I had built there, nothing was worth what was happening to my child. But I was far from home and had to do this thing right. Hold tight, little buddy. Daddy's got this. Having gone to the local police previously, I knew they really couldn't care less and didn't want to be bothered. They offered to interview my ex but said that making an arrest would be difficult without a direct admission of guilt as I did not have any witnesses. It would be my word against hers. An attorney later said that I was fortunate they didn't investigate or she would have likely gotten a talking to at most by the police. She would have denied everything and probably have quickly moved out with the children and filed for divorce with counterclaims. Everything would thereafter be on her turf and terms. I consulted a few local family attorneys about how to get custody and get the kid away from her due to the physical and mental torture. A local attorney advised that men in Eastern Europe do not get custody, much less a foreigner, and especially an American. A man never stands a prayer of being awarded custody unless a woman were deemed by a court to be medically incapacitated and unable to care for herself or the children, a substance addict, or a convicted prostitute. According to an expert on international family law in New York I consulted, he explained that essentially it was a tender years state, not a best interest of the child state. Simply put, he confirmed that a woman could be an alcoholic jerk, beating and assaulting the kids in a cockroach-infested one-room tenement, and you could be George Shawrush the philanthropist, and she'd still get to keep them. Go figure. There was little hope of getting any kind of legal remedy as an expatriate father. It had become a living nightmare. The advice I received from local attorneys was to get my kids out of the country and to the U.S. It was a ray of hope, but it was far from a simple task, albeit the only fighting chance we had. Getting children, especially small children, across the border as an American was going to be a difficult undertaking. It had to get done. I would need to set up an elaborate operation with falsified travel consent documents that were able to pass through exit controls and electronic verification to get my kids out successfully had there been any exit order put in place at her behest. It cost a bundle of money for those documents, but it was worth every penny in retrospect. All would need to be done without raising any suspicion under the watchful eye of the wife or mother-in-law whom she had moved in without my approval a year earlier by saying she was coming to visit and just never left. Any mention of it and there would be a fight. I knew I'd have one chance only. If for any reason my plan failed, was somehow discovered, or got caught leaving, it could potentially mean never seeing my kids again and facing hard time in a foreign prison. Not to mention the life my children would have been relegated to if I were no longer around to protect them. So, six months of elaborate planning and letting her think she had me over a barrel is what it took to prep. Grinning and bearing every test and provocation she put out, knowing that the day of reckoning was nigh. Everything was set and planned for our escape. I worked out every detail I could think of to minimize any risks. Failure was unacceptable. The stakes were too high, and there wouldn't be a second opportunity. Anything less than complete success would be devastating. However, there is no such thing as a fail-safe plan. There is always something that can go wrong. You can only reduce but never completely eliminate risk. Then, just two months before we were supposed to leave, she upped the ante. Not knowing about my plans, she threatened to take the kids and leave unless I sold my house in the States, which was exclusively mine, and bought a mutual residence. It doesn't take a financial guru to see the writing on the wall as far as what her business plan was. The intentions were crystal clear years before. I was toying with the idea of purchasing a property for us, but as time went on, she began showing her true colors, and I quickly got the sense that I would likely get fleeced. Not happening. Simple solution, I continued renting to ensure the most she could get was the last month's rent and some trinkets should things really go south but no assets. Well, Mamar in law started in earnest on the coaching, so I had to play it cool and drag things out long enough to catch that one last flight with my boys. 
I knew the risk was still too high that she might leave with the kids first, so I dangled the carrot, a big one, a real whopper. Pretending to acquiesce, I told her to go ahead and find a good realtor as long as she promised to let up being so harsh on the kid. I believed that would get the kid a little slack since she'd be on her best behavior until she got what she was after. I told her once we co-owned a property, I believed it would be better for our relationship. Hook, line, and sinker. She and mother-in-law were so happy. They swallowed it. Rather, they thought I did. Knowing that once I bought the house, they would then be able to get me out of the picture. As we had been married long enough, she would likely get the majority of the interest in the property based on the local laws favoring women, especially with there being small children in the household. What they didn't understand or appreciate was the fact that they weren't dealing with a wide-eyed, whipped American that was on his back exposing a soft white underbelly. Rather, some good old-fashioned smoke and mirrors before the ball dropped was what was really going down. D-Day was approaching. I told them two months in advance I was taking the boys out of the city on a retreat to a friend's country estate for a couple of days during the spring holidays. Boys only trip. I already had our tickets purchased to Miami two months in advance. The paperwork was in order, and we were ready to bug out. Show time. The morning we were leaving, I had to get the passports out of the safe in our bedroom and walk-in closet without her waking up, along with changing the combination in case she tried to open it before we left the house. We were running late to the airport as I couldn't exactly push too hard to hurry in the AM. She had woken up late, and I certainly wasn't about to behave as if we had a plane to catch. Didn't want to risk raising any suspicion or precipitate an argument or tantrum, which could botch the whole thing. So many variables that could go wrong. We didn't even risk taking a taxi as that could have raised a huge red flag if she were to look out the window by chance. So the Lexus had to be sacrificed and left at the airport for what would be our last ride in it. Holding vigil on the roof of the airport parking garage, the car would remain a last vestige of our exodus for about a year until at last the government finally removed and impounded it. We fought through traffic and arrived at the checking counter about two minutes before the flight was supposed to close. There was a slight flight delay, so it turned out we were fine. Phew. Now came security and customs checkpoints to get on our flight. Although all of my paperwork was in order, having rehearsed many possible scenarios over and again, lines of questioning and answers prepped, outwardly appearing cool, calm, and collected, my insides were like a bowl of jello on a roller coaster, thinking about possible stones left unturned. Deep breath. Following a visual scan of all of the customs agents, I chose a young woman, mid to late twenties, whom I spotted waving goodbye and smiling to a family leaving with small children. Perfect. She asked for our passports and where we were headed for the spring holidays. Told her to visit my mom in Florida and take the kids to Disney World. Easy enough. Next question, why was my wife not traveling with us? I rolled my eyes, letting out a moaning sigh while fumbling deliberately for paperwork with my toddler in my arms who was about to turn three in a week and said that my mother and wife can't stand each other, much less be in the same room and that the fallout of that situation was I now was to suffer through changing diapers for a week on my own if I wanted to take my kids to Disney. Picture Jack Nicholson holding a toddler in one arm and simultaneously looking for paperwork in a haphazard kind of way while attempting to maintain a pleasant demeanor with a young attractive customs agent who was in complete control of the situation and deciding the fate of Disneyland. You'll have an accurate mental image of the scenario. It worked perfectly. The customs agent just about burst out laughing. Success. After being disarmed by what appeared to her to be an inept, bumbling dad suffering the toils of nurturing two tykes on his own, she set us free. Stamp, stamp, stamp. We were cleared to leave. Have a nice trip with your boys, she said as she handed back our documents, never even asking for the notarized parental authorization forms which I had paid a small fortune to procure. Exhale. We had gotten through exit controls, 
and now we had to pray that the plane doesn't get turned around if the wife figured things out and the feds were quick enough to move on it and find our flight. If an international flight is less than halfway to the destination, it can be ordered to land or return to the point of origin. The only other trouble spot could be with US customs once we land. Well, we landed in Miami, and I held my breath once again as we went through customs. This time, we got a stern-looking late 50s agent with a salt and pepper mustache. He was all business and looked like a lifer. He asked what the purpose of our trip was. Grandma and Disney, I said. He pored over our documents with a poker-faced expression, and for what seemed like an eternity, he was intently reading something on his screen. Oh. There went my inside spinning into Jello Roller Coaster Land again. Could he be reading notes to deny entry and detain us? Until finally, the weight in the air was lifted and in a dry monotone voice, he said, Welcome to Miami. Enjoy your stay. We had made it. It just couldn't quite sink in yet. I still felt as if I almost expected to be stopped at any moment with an excuse me, sir, from some unknown direction after almost half a year of living on the edge. Once we got on the sky train, then saw the palm trees there slightly waving in the warm breeze, and breathed in the humid tropical air, I knew that we were home safe in the good old US of A, and I knew it was going to eventually be okay. An international jurisdictional trial ensued for the family law case, and $80,000 later, we won. That's another story, though. But that very moment when the ex-wife and mother-in-law learned that we were out of their clutches and in the States, Priceless.